Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to uh, part two of the Practice Performance Masterclass. Thanks for ortho Five for putting this on. Um, disclosure, uh, Jeff Kozlowski and I do uh, own some shares uh, in ortho Five, so feel free to take uh, all of this as one big sales pitch, or hopefully we, um, we can provide some value for you this evening. I'm not sure how the graphic has me looking taller than Kaz, uh, for those of you have ever stood next to him. He's clearly much taller and larger human being than I am, but I'll take it where I can get it. So, um, so welcome back. Um, we'll jump right in. Uh, we are, this is a two part class. Um, we, Kaz and I will both be, we normally give this in one day, but uh, that's impractical with the COVID stuff. So <clears throat> we're giving it in a, in a course of two, uh, three hour webinars. Um, we both will be referencing some of the information that we talked about in the last part. Okay, so we'll jump right in. Um, remember, I'm going to be talking about some data this evening. Um, you know, this is not stuff we just made up. It comes from over two point, uh, almost two and a half billion dollars in orthodontic production and 550,000 starts with a very good, uh, better than 97% collection rate and uh, um, uh, on top of it, insurance receivables balance. So this is just, again, not stuff we're making up here. This is data uh, from the cleanest data set uh, about consumer buying behavior that's ever been put together in orthodontics. And so we're happy to share some of the insights we've gleaned from it over the years. <clears throat> One of the things that I think is important, and I'm not sure if you can, uh, where this uh, little box here shows up if it's recording my screen, but um, it, it's easy for me to sit here and give a master class on same day starts and make it seem like we've always known this. Um, but in 2014, this is the, um, in September, this is the conversion percent in our office right after we started Orthofy. So, uh, 35%, not very good. Um, I think maybe some of the mythology is that we knew everything and, and somehow started Orthofy and, and put it into systems uh, to help everyone. But in fact, the opposite is true. We knew that we weren't good at everything and we were looking for help and we tried to find some help um, from various people, both in orthodontics and in business and in technology to help us get better. Um, we felt like we were doing good treatment and, and we knew that we were missing something between communicating that to our patients to have them um, start in our practice. And we actually had a very successful practice at the time and, and uh, thought that we were converting around 70 or 80% until we actually started to measure it. Uh, and all of us were surprised that it was 35% converted within 45 days of our recommendation, which is uh, not good. Um, but, uh, we, you know, we're students, we learn from a lot of the really smart people in our business and got a lot of help from, uh, some of the team at OrthoFi along the way, studied and learned. And then, uh, over the years we were able to, um, improve, uh, back at the beginning, we weren't doing same day starts. So we had 0% same day starts. Um, over time, we eventually evolved to doing almost 90% of our starts as same day starts. And that increased our conversion from 35% to 90% where it still maintains today. It fluctuates between high eighties and mid nineties. Um, and so uh, we didn't sort of come out of the womb knowing how to do all this stuff. Uh, last Last presentation, we talked about the three components of a business, which people, process, and technology. Last time we focused a lot on the people. We talked about business strategy, leadership components, uh, hiring strategies. We talked about the big globe picture about the way you need to think um, in order to run an effective business and to be successful at the change management that's required to get your team to start doing things differently, including onboarding same day starts. Today, we're going to talk mostly about the process and the technology and the combination of people, process and technology has allowed us to evolve our practice to become more successful and you guys can do it too. Again, we were clearly um, bottom of the pack when we began. And so <clears throat> if, if you think about the process um, from, you know, from the patient from the beginning the journey from sort of when they contact the office, maybe to the left of this diagram would be, you know, website or Google somehow, but uh, basically they, they call the office, um, they decide to make an appointment. You know, your office has to be good at changing from a call to an appointment. You wanna get some information from them. You wanna then also verify if they have insurance and, and what the value of that insurance is for them. You'd like to bring them in for exam. Maybe they're ready for treatment, maybe they're not. If they're not, they go into observation management. If they are, you recommend treatment and there's some sort of financial conversation that ensues, whether you do it on pencil and paper or use a digital slider device of which there's many now. <clears throat> 
it'd be nice if you're going to extend credit to people to know their credit worthiness. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, is there a yes? Do they do treatment? If there is yes, uh, then you sign the documents, you have receivables to manage, you put the braces on and you, you treat the patient. If there's not, um, you know, if they need to go talk to dad or whatever the reason may be, uh, you need to follow up with them. And we call that pending management when you recommend treatment and they haven't started yet. It's a pending patient is the way we call it. So <clears throat> this is basically the process flow. And um, there's nothing magic about it. Um, we're going to fo focus mainly on this circle here to the left for the majority of the presentation and talk a little bit about um, receivables at the very end. But <clears throat> uh, nothing, like I said, we'll talk about is magic. Um, there's a process. And what our job to do is to A, try to figure out what is the best way, what is the best process, putting one foot in front of the other to take a patient from the beginning of the time they interact with a practice into if they need treatment, recommending, diagnosing obviously accurately. And, um, you know, and just to start, I guess, as we talk about sales, you know, the number one thing behind any of this is integrity. So we should never be recommending treatment that we wouldn't do for our own family members. So this isn't how to sell treatment to people who don't need it. Inherent in all this is assuming that you have the integrity behind your recommendation and you have the accurate diagnosis and treatment planning because our clinical integrity and clinical outcome is, is we as orthodontists need to be the gold standard to compete uh, with a growing number of orthodontic options for consumers in our space that are not the gold standard. And, and if we want to continue to enjoy our profession, which is the best in the world, in my opinion, that gold standard needs to be maintained. After that, you know, just because we're the best orthodontists in town doesn't mean our consumers know that. Um, and it doesn't mean that they perceive the value, the why that they should become customers and pay us five or six or $7,000 for the pleasure of our services. And so what we need to do is put together a process that communicates all of that to the patient uh, that's repeatable, that's not salesy or pushy. Um, and as you walk through that process, uh, you want to be able to identify the key areas along the way where you're either performing well, you want to understand your performance, you want to have a scoreboard, you know. How is your score? What's your percentage? Uh, what's your batting average? If, um, you know, is your batting average bad so that you swing and miss at almost everything that comes down or are you hitting most of them? So we call it a leaky bucket theory. So along the way, you have many holes in your bucket and you want to know where the patients, prospective patients are leaking out. And what numbers do is they put into objective terms rather than subjective feeling terms, objective terms. So we understand and can benchmark our performance relative to what outstanding performance would be. So we're going to walk you through some of the different metrics and measurements that we've identified along the sales process that we just showed you, help you understand what great performance is and what you should be doing to measure, measure it, and then how you can also improve on the process. So, you know, we can get into website marketing, um, Google Analytics, uh, paid search, SEO, Facebook, and all that some other time. Uh, that's maybe more of a conversation for the Kyle Fagalas of the world, but the, uh, the Dustin Burlesons, but the marketing area, we're going to start with once the phone rings. Okay. So when the phone rings, what are some key components to how you handle your call? So number one, um, you want to be short and sweet. So no, um, you know, it's a, a lot of the times moms that are calling, no mom gets a referral from her dentist uh, to come uh, to the orthodontist and then expects to have a 15 minute phone call um, or a 20 minute phone call when they call in. They're calling to give you quick information, get an appointment and get off the phone because they probably are in their minivan with a bunch of kids that they're trying to get on to soccer practice and whatever else they don't want to call and hang out with you. So you want to ask them name, phone, email, only email, uh, ask for their address if you're going to actually send them something in the mail. If not, use online forms to gather the rest. Keep your appointment short and sweet. <clears throat> you want to make sure that you compliment the doctor. So last time we talked about... Um, some of Robert Cialdini's principles of influence, one of which is called social proof. So, um, you know, as a doctor, if I, if I say, hey, I'm the best doctor in the world, you know, you should come to me because I really know what I'm doing. People think I'm a jerk, right? Or think I'm full of myself or whatever. However, if whoever's on the phone <clears throat> answering calls for your office says, you know, I can't wait for you to meet Dr. Kozlowski. Um, he's amazing. He lectures all over the world. He does a lot of clinical trials and, you know, plus he's a hell of a lot of fun. Uh, that's a lot more powerful for the patient than coming from the doctor. 
okay? So make sure your front desk team is complimenting the doctor as you're scheduling. Okay, so then you want to mention the same day start. Um, I have this little cash register uh, noise in the background just to sort of get your attention. Um, the way that you know your process isn't working well if you want to do same day starts in your office is that when you're in the exam room, if you tell the patient, hey, um, you know, and if you want, you'd be able to get your braces on today. And they look at you with a lot of surprise, like, wow, today, I, you know, um, I'm surprised about that. Um, then you know your process is wrong. It, it's very difficult to not sound salesy or pushy uh, to ask for things after you've talked about money or once you talked about starting with them. So you want them to be thinking about the fact they can get started with that appointment well before they come in. The last time we talked about WIIFM, everyone's favorite radio station, What's In It For Me Radio. And so people are selfish. They're thinking about their own thing all the time. They're not thinking about your office. Um, or why they should come in. And so you want to mention the fact that they get started with treatment several times along the way to foam the runway just to get them thinking about it. And then just the simple fact of thinking about it will not make it surprising to them when you offer it to them when you've uh, talked about money and whatnot. And that's a huge difference in making same day start sound salesy or pushy. Okay, and we'll get into more detail with that later. So that little sound effect there is just to sort of wake you up when we, when we drop those in along the way. <clears throat> and then you want to tee up your confirmation call. So um, if you all are anything like me, I pretty much don't answer calls from anyone that's uh, not in my phone. So you want to mention to them that someone from your office will be calling for two reasons. One, you want to increase the chance of them answering it. And the second thing is that you want that to seem expected. So if, if your treatment coordinator calls for a confirmation, which is super important, and they're not expecting it, it may come off as seeming pushy if they're accepting it. If they're expecting it, then it's just part of what the process for your office is. And the confirmation call, um, you know, once you answer the phone to begin with, may be the most important thing uh, in the process. And then you want a secret shop. Uh, if you don't do that, you'll be shocked at some of the things your team uh, says on the phone. And you also want to make sure that your people on your team understand buying signal. So buying signal would be Hey, do you take my insurance? No, click, right? Uh, many of us have that. And so what the patient is really saying is, hey, I'm interested in orthodontic treatment. I'm also interested in your office, but affordability is important to me and I'd like to see how my insurance plays into that. Uh, and so we also know that, you know, and we'll talk more about this later, that price, um, overall price and how much the patient has to pay is not the only factor in their uh, buying decision. So if you have value to offer them, you want them to come in, see your process, meet your doctors, learn about your office, uh, and just hang up on them because you may or may not, quote unquote, take their insurance. Even uh, many times if you're out of network, you can still get them the same benefit that they would have even if you were in network. Um, so you want to get those patients in your office and you want to make sure your team is doing it. I, in my office, I have no affiliation with this, but I use the Jay Geyer Scheduling Institute. Uh, to train our team um, they have like an at-home module that has worked really great for us so um, you may want to consider that or something else uh, but you want to make sure you're training and um, secret shopping uh, your people a really really key thing you know we, we really don't have other than e existing patients who are in the office making appointment for siblings or the or the parents the only other way to get in touch with our office is, is through the phones. Uh, even if you use sort of some online scheduling software, uh, most of it still today winds up uh, in some sort of phone call. Many of the Google AdWords, uh, if you click on, you know, call is one of the functions they can call right from your cell phone. So you need to be measuring how well you're answering the phone. How, when someone calls, how often do you, um, do you answer the call? And so, what this shows is uh, there's a few ways to look at it. There's time of day. So during a particular time of day, what's your answer rate? So this orange are the, month, the ones that you answered and the blue is the ones that you didn't. And we were not growing. In fact, uh, there was a time last uh, January and February before um, COVID where we, for the first time in 12 years, had a down month. We were down 20% and we couldn't figure out what the heck was going on and we weren't looking at this. And we had two of our phone people who had moved on someplace else and we didn't replace them. And our phone girls were busy, uh, but we didn't know that they were, the phone was ringing too much for them to keep up and we were missing, you know, 50% of the calls coming in sometime. And this is really helpful information. And as soon as we, you know, turned this around and get hired some people and made some more phones available, people to answer, 
um, we started doing better and then COVID hit, so you never know what's in the future. Um, but uh, as you'll see, this is super important. Uh, another way to look at it is um, by day. So again, at the same time, you could see the best we were doing was around 60% of the calls answered during that time, which is really, really bad. You wanna be aiming for 90% and above. And so your handle rate, one of the things very few people talk about in ortho, but um, is super critical because if your phones, if you're doing all the things to make your phone ring, but you're not answering them, you know, many of the marketing activities are very expensive. So um, if you're doing those things to make the phone ring and then you don't answer it, that's a humongous um, self-inflicted wound, right? Um, and, and the other way to kind of look at this is, is by month where you're looking at the missed calls and the squiggly yellow line is the call handle rate. This is where we started to do better. Um, you know, after we learned here where we were doing really bad, we went back up here and then summer came and we were, didn't have enough again and then we peaked back up again. So it's a constant battle, but you see we're more 80, 90% here, um, the, the troughs are the weekends where we don't answer the phone, but you, you need to be looking at this data and you need to be aiming for it. So if you're doing stuff like this, many of us are doing Google AdWords or paid search or Facebook, and that's, that's a big push in order to, you know, the high end marketing offices are doing those. You have a lot of people who are selling you this service, but if you're not answering your dang phones, uh, at least 90% of the time, you're just pouring your money down the drain, save your money, fix your phones. That's by far the number one thing. Um, if you take anything from this, most of your phone systems can measure handle rate. If you don't get yourself a phone system that can, we're in the process of switching to weave. I don't have any affiliation with them, but they have got a cool service or any of your other phones. Our current phones are Avaya and you, there's software is called call rail or some other ones you can plug in and you just want to know how many of the calls that are coming in am I missing? Uh, super important and everything else is secondary to that. Now, next in the call strategy is you wanna measure, uh, do your new patient exam show up? So this blue line here is the amount of the exams that schedule, and the red line here is the attrition, the amount of the exams that actually show. So you want this spread here uh, to be about 10%, so you want 90% of the ones that you schedule uh, to actually show up. Um, it's hard unless you listen to every single call to know what your phone skills are, and how, um, how skilled your team is, um, and is your team really doing a good job with your confirmation calls? And so I think uh, an easy metric um, is sort of a substitute of listening to all your calls is to measure that spread of kept new patient exams. So I think it's reasonable that if you're not doing a good job confirmation calls, or if your phone team is not friendly and kind and, and get them on and off the phone quickly, um, then this spread will grow to you know, 10, 15, 20, 25%. And so uh, it's great to make the phone ring, it's great to answer it, it's great to schedule the new patient, but you wanna make sure that new patient shows up. And I think 90% call handling rate where you answer and 90% kept new patient exam rate are, are two of the critical metrics because you know, kept new patient exams and TRC treatment rec recommended conversion, which we talked some about last time, the critical metrics of practice growth. So if you're looking at some KPIs and you wanna know, uh, are your, is your practice gonna grow? You wanna know how many patients are coming in, what the spread is from what's scheduled to what are actually showing up, and are you converting them? Those are the two numbers you need to be looking at. Um, third in this process is, is uh, or at least some component of kept new patient exam would be your call handle rate. So you wanna know and understand that. Next thing, if you do ask for their address, you want to send them something at home. Uh, if you don't ask for their address, that means you're not sending something home. Don't ask for their address and then don't send them anything. They can just fill that out on the form. It takes too much time. So one of the things that we do is we send uh, what the marketing guru Dan Kennedy calls a shock and awe package. Um, and so this envelope shows up um, after they get off the phone with taking the new patient call. They uh, drop these. We have them kind of pre-made and drop it in the mail. And if this package could speak, it would say, um, open me, right? It doesn't look like a bill. It looks like something fun. So we want to make it so that they can open it. Um, this one is a little more expensive to ship. Um, we've played around with different ones. We're currently using one that's not quite the big foamy sparkly one, but um, still a thinner, it probably costs a dollar to send, uh, or $1.50, but um, still doesn't look like a bill. 
um, but you can see the size of it and when it shows up in the mail um, it's something that looks more interesting you just want them to open it inside uh, is a folder uh, remember we're talking about what's in it for me you don't want to be bragging on yourself here you don't want to say we're awesome we're this we're that we're a diamond provider whatever um, you want to say hey, uh, your amazing smile awaits something that, um, you know, is in it for the patient. Uh, so your amazing smile awaits. Last time we talked about looking at your pronouns and make sure most of the pronouns that are talking about them, not about I'm this and I'm that, okay? And so we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, this is uh, one of the pages that sits on top when they open up the folder. Um, I probably need to update this. Uh, it has uh, one of my favorite people, Dr. Andrea Drop, who um, has moved to Philadelphia and is now uh, anxiously awaiting um, her, her first child with her new husband, Andrew Appel, who is generally a good guy, but uh, I'm still bitter about him uh, stealing Andrea from us. But, um, uh, but either way, you get uh, the gist here. So they open this up. It, it sort of shows us what's going on in this packet. And then if you look here, um, you know, it says uh, one of the things that separates our practice from the rest is the ability to start your journey on Amazing Smile on your first visit. So does every person open up and read this? No, but it's there for them along the way to, again, start grooming them to start thinking about same day starts. So when you look in here, that, that uh, page is sitting right here on top of the Our Doctor's Brief History Start here. Um, but if you, you, know, you open this and you know, where do we want them to look first? We want them to look here, start here, right? It's, it's, we want to make it as obvious for them as possible. Uh, many times you open notebooks or folders and um, it's just word vomit. There's so many words, it's hard to know where to go. You want to make things very easy for people. Uh, if they want to contact someone, they want it to be friendly. Hi, I'm Mal. Um, here's my information if you want to contact us. So under the start here, we want to make it very simple. Easy as one, two, three. Complete your health history forms. And we're going to talk about why that's super critical in a minute. Uh, we talked a little bit about it last time to uh, prepare to get started, help us develop a custom financing plan, right? So then here we say, we know you're busy. Your time is valuable for your convenience if orthodontic treatment is recommended, we always reserve time to get you started on the same day as your appointment. Not pushy, just telling them, hey, we know you're busy. We, you know, our pronoun know that you're busy and the subject of the we is them, right? Uh, if treatment is recommended for you, we reserve time to get you started. So again, go through your pronouns and get rid of all the I's and we's or use them to show the value for the patient, not to talk about yourself. The other thing is, you know, guess what? Braces cost money. Um, a lot of people run away from, you know, and get afraid of the financial conversation. Um, but there's been studies that show that, like, parents that have twin babies, you know, when the dad, the first two things they worry about, number one is if it's girls' wedding, right, paying for two weddings. And the second thing they worry about is paying for braces, two braces at the same time. People know that orthodontic treatment is expensive. I don't think it's any secret. Uh, most of us drive around town in nice cars anyway, so even if it were a secret, we're not very good keepers of that secret. So, you know, what you want them to do is start thinking about it. We pride ourselves in never letting affordability stand in the way of life's changing smile transformation. So please consider a down payment, a monthly payment that works from your budget, and we will do the rest for you. Many people don't even know that there's financing uh, or 0% financing available for braces. We take that for granted, uh, but if you, ask, if you listen to them, they're asking all the time, hey, do you guys finance at other payment plans? Uh, affordability is the key to all of this, and you want to let them know, hey, start thinking about what works for you, because um, we won't let affordability stand in the way. We can get to some financial strategy in a bit. Uh, it also goes in a book. Um, friends of mine, John Graham and Dustin Burleson, two super bright guys, have both written these books, and um, you know, I started to understand uh, that any of us can write a book. You just have to go through the process of actually doing it. Any of the thing that's in any of our books isn't, isn't something that most of us don't talk about in the treatment consultation room, a book's worth by the end of every single day. Um, but what this does is it puts into words something that the customer could read. Um, and then there's a great book by Adam Witte and Rusty Shelton. If you've never seen Adam Witte speak, he's great. Rusty's great too, the, called Authority Marketing. And it talks about, you know, by becoming an author, um, it then helps build the process of your personal authority as an expert in the field. Um, remember one of Cialdini's 
uh, principles of influence is authority, and there's no better way to do that than to author stuff, especially a book. So we'll have patients come in that have read the whole book. They've got little sticky notes on different pages and highlights and stuff. And so those patients' conversion percentage is 100% because the way that they now think about orthodontics has been taught to them by me, right? So then when I go talk to them about what I think about orthodontics, they're nodding their head because they agree with me because they've read the stuff in the book that teaches them how to think about orthodontics, which is what we want them to think. So another good thing is when you have somebody that's in there for multiple opinions, you can say, hey, we're all about education here, so why don't you take a copy of the book? You can read it. Um, and it really is, a, is something that lends that concept of authority, which, again, from Cialdini's research is very powerful. Um, and there's, you know, countless um, examples throughout history, even recent history, where authority can be used for good or bad, but it's, either way, it's a powerful and influential concept. So educational authority is, is important. Uh, next up is a confirmation call. Again, a, a critical component. Um, to what, we're, uh, what we want to do to help inform the patient and to get them thinking about things ahead of time. So I'll share with you an example of um, one of our TCs on a confirm uh, confirmation call, Mel. Um, is one of our awesome TCs. And, um, so Hi, Mr. Say. Smith. My name is Melissa with Spillane and Reynolds Orthodontics. I'm calling to confirm Joey's appointment tomorrow at 3 p.m. I wanted to set some expectations for your visit. Uh, if Dr. Reynolds thinks that Joey is ready to begin treatment, we very well could get you started tomorrow. So think about a comfortable down payment and monthly payment that might work for you, and we will review all of your options. Please let me know if you have any questions, and I look forward to meeting you. See you tomorrow. <clears throat> Okay, so great job, Mel. Um, very friendly, right? Um, ideally, you can talk to them. Maybe they screen you, maybe they don't. If you don't, you can leave that as a voicemail. Uh, one of the things our team is doing now is that um, if you get their voicemail, um, we'll uh, not leave a message if they don't answer, and we'll shoot a little video for them and send that to them instead as a text, which they're more likely to look at. We just want to get in front of them and, and, again, get them thinking. So your components of your confir confirmation call, excuse me, other than being friendly, is gather any missing information, remind them to fill out their forms. So, hey, um, fill out your forms. The reason why I want you to fill out your forms um, is mainly because we want to be able to verify your insurance ahead of time. We'll talk about that in a minute. Tee up uh, financials. Expect out-of-pocket expense. Braces cost money. Surprise, surprise. Um, and then consider what monthly and down payments work for you. Again, reinforcing this. So you want to be um, mentioning these things to them several times to get them to actually rise to the surface of their consciousness so they begin to think about it. <clears throat> Again, same day start. Hey, we can get your braces on the same day if treatment's recommended, so um, we look forward. You know, we're doing it for your convenience. As part of the information gathering, you know, you, we talked about the forms. Um, you know, this is an OrthoFi webinar, um, so I'm going to be showing you uh, some of the things in the OrthoFi software um, for several reasons. One, you know, OrthoFi is putting this on, so showing it for them. Two, um, you know, a lot of these things are, are things that I was part of helping develop over time, so it's kind of like a you know, fourth child of mine. Uh, so I'm, I'm clearly biased, so take that into consideration. Um, but this is what we use in our office. This is our process that I'm going to show you. And I do believe, uh, without a shadow of the doubt, that when we talk about people, process, and technology, that this is the best technology that's available in the marketplace um, to help you manage both from an object met objective metric standpoint and from a process standpoint, because uh, all these things are built into it, um, your ability to, to put the right process and te technology in place to help you um, make sure that patients belong, uh, in my opinion, in the hands of a highly skilled orthodontist, which is you, and we want the patients to, to belong in your office, and we believe that there isn't anything better than this um, to help you do that. So we're going to show you some of the features of the technology. Uh, this is not the only way to do it, so there's ways that you can kind of cobble all these things together and do it on your own. Um, but I'll show you what we do, and the fundamentals here is that if you're not doing these exact forms, you want to do something like it. If you're not using the treatment slider, I'm going to show you you want to do something like it. Does it have to be a slider? No, you can use your TC, but the fundamentals are all the same. So uh, as we walk through the fundamentals, if you don't want to, you know, 
think about the orthofy stuff, that's fine, but pay attention to the fundamentals. So this goes through on text. Why do we put it through on, uh, on text? Because you know, a lot of people will answer a text that we don't want to, uh, that don't do on email. You can get it on email too. Most people, the open rate um, for text is better. So, hey, um, please complete these forms before your exam date. Click, right? And if there's certain sort of automated things that go out to remind them. Uh, there's a HIPAA notice. So this all lives in there. Check this box. They can read it. They can click through whatever it is that they want. Patient information. So it fills out all their stuff, including their address and all of that. Um, there is a way to pre-populate this for them. So I would suggest the things that you... Um, ask them on the phone that you pre-populate here for them so they don't have to write in again. There's nothing more annoying for me than going to a doctor's office and having a clipboard with like five forms and half the crap on the forms ask the same questions over and over again. So usually I'll just X them out and say, see form number one and write it in annoyed while I'm doing it. Like we don't want to annoy our prospective customers, okay? So uh, try to fill it out for them. Medical history, you know, you can go there through and click on all these, make it really easy. Um, and this all flows into something that works in the process later, which will show you. And, and then a critical component for same day starts is filling out the insurance because we want to get that insurance verified before they come in so that we know what their benefit is so that when we talk to them about their, they, they care less about what the total cost is and more about what their total cost is, what's in it for me, right? So how much out of pocket for me? <clears throat> and so, um, you know, getting the insurance ahead of time is really important. So when OrthoFi has, uh, uh, when, the, when the forms are filled out, uh, you know, there's sort of future forms, there's um, same day forms, and then there's urgent forms. So an urgent form would be um, any form that's filled out two hours or less before the scheduled time for the exam. So there's a little fire drill that has to happen and there's quite a lot of technology behind the insurance process at OrthoFi, so verifying the, the stuff. There's an algorithm that takes care of about 50% of the checks automatically and within a few seconds, but the rest of it has to get done the old-fashioned way. Somebody has to pick up the phone, and if that means sitting on hold for a half an hour to get the information, they have to do that. And so um, there kind of has to be a fire drill if, for the ones that they're going to have to sit on the phone with. And so OrthoFi measures the urgent check rate. Um, and they originally started measuring the urgent check rate so that they could coach the practices um, how to not have urgent checks to fill it out ahead of time, mainly in a self-serving way a little bit so that OrthoFi could get the information to them in a timely way at the exam so the practice wasn't waiting around for this information and then getting annoyed with OrthoFi for why they don't have it, right? But remember, they, they might have to sit on the phone for a half hour just like you would, and if they fill out the forms five minutes before you recommend treatment, it's sometimes impossible to get the numbers back. So that's why they started looking at this. And this is one of the things that's really fascinating about metrics is that you can look at one metric and it might tell you one story, but a lot of times there's other metrics that are buried. So what they looked at is that the things go out automatically and um, you know they work well. So over 70% of the patients that come in, fill out the forms, including the insurance form, before they come in. That's great, right? The best practices in OrthoFi do about 10% better. So they're, you know, 85%-ish fill out the stuff before they come in. So it's a 10, 11% spread in form fill, which is helpful to OrthoFi and for the office, but doesn't seem like a, a metric that has a ton of magnitude. Well, what they realized is, is when they looked at the same-day contract rate, the amount of patients that did same-day signing based on urgent check rate, what they found was is there's a 53% difference in the practices that are doing same-day starts versus the urgent check rate. And you say, well, this metric doesn't look like much. This metric is a huge, earth-shattering, practice-changing, life-changing difference here. Okay, so what's the reason behind it? And, and we think that there's two reasons. Number one, um, in order to do a same day start, you need to be able to present the information to the patient about how much their out of pocket cost is, which I just talked about. You cannot do that unless you have the insurance information. And many times, if you're doing the urgent checks, you don't have that insurance information when it's time to recommend. 
So you probably appoint that patient for another day, which decreases your conversion rate naturally. You can easily know that there's a direct and linear correlation between same day starts and conversion percentage. We talked about this last time. The second thing is that during the confirmation call, they're telling them to fill out their forms, number one, which drives this up. You know, hey, fill out your forms if you haven't done it. Two, you know, the, um, they're also telling them, hey, same day start, right? Hey, think about down payments. We can get treatment started that day. We're tuning the radio station until it's possible. And so they're proactively going out, they're playing offense, right? They're saying, we know a confirmation call works. We wanna continue to set the expectations for these patients. And so they're proactively going out and calling them when they see the forms aren't filled out. And even though it only makes a 10% difference in check rate, it makes a 53% difference in same day start rate. So this is a huge validation of, of the confirmation call. Even though the initial metric doesn't look like much, the underlying metric, the deeper metric is humongous. So confirmation call and having that insurance filled out ahead of time are two really critical pieces to the process that you need to be doing the process and technology in order to um, make it happen. You need to understand what that means. Another thing that happens with the forms is that the asks are a series of sliding bar questions. You know, what's important to you, length of treatment, comfort, clear and visible quality, low month, uh, monthly, blah, blah, blah. And so they kind of fill out what that looks like. And one of the things they also ask on here is how interested are you starting with the next month? So it gets that sort of foaming the runway where you can know, you know, you can know how interested they are, A, but it, again, it starts them thinking about it. So thinking about all these things ahead of time is the most important thing. I'll say it a bunch. The difference between seeming pushy when you ask for money. Uh, so when you ask for money, that's the, that's the point of sale, we call it. So, hey, braces is $5,000, $6,000, let's go, right? If the patient has any question about anything, financial or otherwise, or the ability for them to start the same day, if they don't know all that stuff ahead of time, anything that comes after that point, any additional information, if it's regarding them starting treatment, seems pushy. Okay, so the, the, you can definitely be sort of sleazy and pushy ahead of time. What you want to be doing is just giving them information, asking them questions, answering them. We can get to that a little along the way, but all of the potential objections and all the value of your practice needs to be communicated before you ask for those dollars. Once you ask for them, anything that comes after is the reason why you may sound or feel pushy. So if you're like, hey, why don't we get started today and they haven't thought about it yet, they're like, whoa, 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 they pumped the brakes, right? But if they've been thinking about all these things ahead of time, um, it's good. And one of the ways that you'll know your process is working is when your customer comes in and they say, yeah, yeah, I know we can get started today, but Johnny's got soccer practice, right? And so you may at first think like, oh, am I being too pushy and telling them so many times ahead of time? No, okay? The fact that they know that they can do it is exactly what you want. And what they're really saying is that I don't want to get started today because I think Johnny's soccer practice is more important than the convenience of the same day start. But many of those people, once you get through, you know, or I, I, I don't know that I understand the value of your practice yet. I'm not sure I want to do business with you. Um, but many of those people say, I'm not going to start today. They wind up starting that same day because you, your, your process communicates the value to them and then they start. So if they're telling you that they don't want to start today, that means your process is working. If they're surprised when you mention it to them in the exam room, that means your process is not working. Okay. Easy ways to measure it. So when you welcome to the office, um, this is something that we did do and will do. Um, we're not doing quite the same white glove service with the COVID stuff still, <clears throat> but we do have coffee and cookies available for them. We have the cookies sort of prepackaged that we can hand out. Um, normally we have a tray that we serve this stuff on and we um, will offer them water if they don't like coffee. Um, and then we give them these little mugs afterwards. And, uh, and so again, we're, you know, uh, Child Union's principle of reciprocity, people like to repay in kind what's given to them. So you're giving them a little gift uh, but you're giving it before you're asking them for anything. Many of us give patients t-shirts after they um, start in the practice. Well, Child Union's principles would say, you know, you give them a t-shirt um, in your practice because you want them to go around and be little billboards for you, self-serving, right? Maybe the kids like the t-shirts, maybe they don't. Um, if you give it to them before um, they start pay, uh, uh, treatment with you, it seems like a gift, 
if you give that to them after, it seems like a marketing gimmick. So giving them that gift triggers the principle of reciprocity, whether it's t-shirts or a coffee mug or whatever. And then I would encourage you that if people in your office, like the girls, the team in the office loves this, and uh, you know, lots of people in the office love these little mini uh, knockoff Yetis. I use them at the home at home all the time. So you know, we switched to this because I was reaching past my porcelain coffee mugs with my own name on it to get another coffee mug. And so if you won't drink out of your own coffee mug, nobody else probably will. Um, and so if your team and uh, people in your office are sort of clamoring for your swag, we have these little round chapsticks and these different um, mugs and a certain type of little zipper bag that everybody likes to use. That's a good idea that you're spending money uh, well there. Uh, $4 worth of nothing with some crappy swag that nobody's going to use uh, is probably not as good as $6 worth of something that you use. So take a look at your swag. I call it playing swag survivor. <clears throat> try to have a contest and vote some of them off the island and try to limit your swag to the things that people use and consider maybe doing something like this where you give them something before you ask them uh, for money. And again, uh, whoever serves this to them is also mentioning to them, you know, hey, just remember, uh, if the doctor recommends treatment today, we've got some time for you in the schedule. So we, we, we're all about convenience. We just want to help you um, save some time. We know you're busy. Okay, the exam process. Um, this is an amazing book. Um, Chris Voss, Never Split the Difference. Um, I, I probably read it 10 times, and I, I listen to it on Audible now at, at very fast clip because I've read it so many times, and it's every time I listen to it, it reminds me of what an amazing book in it. It is, um, and so you could do a whole day-long course just on this book, and <coughs> Voss gives his own master class on the book. But there's an interesting line in there. Um, if you approach a negotiation thinking uh, that the other guy thinks like you're, you're wrong, that's, em uh, that's not empathy, that's projection. So many of the people we have in our office, especially our treatment coordinators, pride themselves on being empathetic. They pride themselves on having high emotional intelligence, or they should. And um, they, they try to put themselves in the shoes of, um, of the patients. But what happens many times is that if the treatment quarter is having financial trouble or maybe they wouldn't buy the retainer guarantee or the whitening because they don't think about it like that. I had a TC that doesn't spend any money on interest at all in their life. She hates interest. And so her patients that went through Orthofy, even though it's offered, never picked interest, right? Those behaviors are not empathy. Those are not trying to think like your customer or your prospective customer. That's projection. That's you putting your crap on them, right? And so your job is not to put your crap on them. Your job is to understand them and try to help them with what they want, right? So you're not out like the pizza company with the big sign spinning it saying, come in and get braces, right? They've gone through a lot of stuff to come in to your office. And your job is not to put your crap on them. Your job is to understand what it is they want and help them find a way to get what they want. Very simple. And there's a lot of different ways that different people can do it. And whether that's um, paying in full because they want a little bit of a savings or that's just how they work or that's having a really affordable payment so they can actually make the payments even if that means paying a little interest um, or that means that they first class everything and they just want the whole enchilada even if you wouldn't buy it, that's for them. So your job is not to be projecting your stuff on them but, um, but to understand what they want. So as a TC, number one, be friendly. You know, you wanna take pictures and x-rays that helps with clarity. Uh, you don't want to spend a lot of time on the x-ray because it might as well be written in Martian for the patients. You look at them all the time. They don't. Um, I find CBCTs to be a lot more instructional. So we have 3Ds in all of our offices, and the patients get their bearings a lot more with impacted teeth and whatnot on the CBCT 3D than they do with a pan, but you can do it your own way. You want to ask open-ended questions. Hey, Johnny, are you excited to get braces? No, right? Uh, that's not an open-ended question, right? You want to try to avoid the, the questions that are bear traps that leads to no. That's awkward, right? Uh, how are you doing today? Um, bad, right? Probably also a question you want to avoid. What brings you in today? How can I help you? What is it that you're concerned with? If I had a magic wand, uh, what thing would you want me to fix, right? Like those are open-ended questions. You want to get them talking. Many times all you need to do is ask questions and sit back and be quiet. And they'll tell you everything that they need to hear um, in order for them to see the value in your services. Now, if someone says they want to fix this crooked tooth and they could care less about their overbite, 
does that mean in the uh, office that you're not going to fix the overbite? I hope not, right? Like you should be doing all the things to do amazing ortho regardless of what it is the patient understands at the moment. And you can be coaching them along the way. But if all they care about is this tooth, you better make dang sure that you're talking to them about that tooth. Don't skip over it for all the things that you care about as the ortho or the TC. Make sure you identify what it is that they're there for and you, you give them the confidence that you're going to treat that. That's what they find value. And then you do all the rest of the stuff for them anyway and educate them all along the way. We talked about the uh, in the last class the ABCs of sales theory now for Daniel Pink, attunement, buoyancy, and clarity. Okay, The whole goal of tuning their antennas for their what's in it for me radio station is to get in tune, attunement with the way they're thinking. It's like, uh, it's, it's sort of the cousin to empathy, understanding what's, what their goals and emotions are. And the other thing is you want to help understand what it is that they find valuable so you can communicate that value to them in a way that they'll understand. Um, you want to talk about your tech if you have it, show them all the whiz bang that you have. A lot of doctors like to talk about this. I would say doctors, your time is better spent in the clinic making teeth straight and really spend some time developing the skill set uh, of your treatment coordinators and allow them to be able to speak confidently about the technological things that you um, want them to understand. And, you know, your braces, your aligners, uh, your CBCT, all those things, teach them why it's cool. Let them talk about it, okay? You've got better things to do. And again, you want them to talk about starting today. Um, and then you can go out and, and meet the doctor to brief. Now, there's... The, the, the main job of the TC is be friendly and build rapport, right? Um, this is a relationship thing. Our business is a relationship business. We deal with families. TC's job, build rapport. And the other thing is understand the value that they're looking for. So build that attunement. Um, and then you want to be talking about the whole time in your questions why your office is providing the value um, that they need. The other thing it's important for the TCs to do is when they get the answers to the questions, in those questions is some objections, okay? And um, you want to manage those objections. So you want to be talking about, you know, hey, I need to talk to dad. Well, maybe you can get him on the phone. Or, hey, I need my uh, check with my insurance. Well, we've already verified that for you. Or, hey, um, you know, blah, 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 blah. You can be managing those objections so they're all out of the way. Um, at the end of this presentation, I'm going to send you another link. We have only in 90 minutes for this, so, um, and it's a whole day long thing to get really into the weeds with the TC stuff. So what I'm showing you is the process and technology part. There's also a, a sort of the next down layer of the process is, um, what we call proactive, uh, value creation and proactive ob objection management. So you're doing all these things proactively because you know they're going to ask about them before you get to the point of sale so that it doesn't seem pushy. You just don't have enough time to get into all the exact scripting. Uh, at the bottom, I'm going to share a link with you for a same-day start master class, uh, master class that we did with Brian Wright and um, Dr. Waldeman uh, out in Beverly Hills, and then uh, one of my really amazing TCs, Danielle Offerman. And we really get in the weeds of all of the exact scripting for the TCs. So if you want to learn all of that uh, nitty gritty on that stuff, just follow the link at the end. And it's a free course that you can watch it. It's the same 90 minutes. <clears throat> and it talks about whether you're doing uh, virtual consults or in-person consults, what the fundamentals are, and all the scripting and objection overcoming stuff um, that you'll need to know. Um, Simon Sinek has written a great book, Start With Why, um, but why is a tough question to ask in the consult room. So anytime you use the word why, it seems a bit accusational. So why are you here? Why would you do this? Why are you thinking that way? It makes people uh, on the defensive a little bit, which you want to avoid in the process. So get to the bottom of why, but don't ask, don't use it asking the word why. So help me understand uh, what your concerns are, what brings you in here today. So use how and what. Uh, where, uh, but try to avoid why if you can. You want to give them an office tour. This is something that Danielle goes into in detail in our other presentation, but um, an office tour isn't just to show them your brushing station. Uh, it's to do two things. It's to be conversational, so you're, you're talking, you're building the relationship with the patient as you're showing them around the office, but it's really to build the value. So this is our 3D low-dose x-ray machine. Talk about why that's great. Here's our clinic. They're really highly skilled. Clinic waves at them. Hey, we're really friendly. There's our doctor. He's amazing. Remember, uh, someone else saying that social proof about you is more important than you saying it yourself. 
Um, and then using that to get in tune with what the asking open-ended questions along the way. And so if you want the whole details of that, that's in that other presentation. Once the TC has all the information, the photos and the x-ray, they can meet the doctor. Um, there's one of two ways you could do. You could do a TC-driven consult or you could do a doctor-driven consult. Um, either way you can do it. Again, we get into all the details of that in the other presentation. Um, but the TC and the doctor will meet outside the exam room to brief. Um, and if you don't have a TC, you need one. So um, part of the OrthoFi software is, has this thing we call the cheat sheet. Um, and basically it takes all the medical information they got on the forms before and it distills it down to, you know, what's, uh, why am I there, your chief complaint, bad grill, who referred them, you want to know and maybe, you know, say something nice about their dentist if you go in there. Um, and then, uh, you know, what happened, I got a hockey puck in the face or whatever. And then those sliding bars before it gives you a quick and easy thing about what's important. So, um, you know, if you're going into this exam, you're going to want to be talking about what your clear options are and you want to make sure your TC is hitting on the affordability of the low monthly. You want to be talking about, hey, length of treatment is really important. Quality is important as well. So one word, and, and by the way, quality is a word that's important for everyone. Like 95% of the people out there pick quality as being either very or extremely important. So which one word are we making sure that our TC and our doctors are using all the time? The word quality, you guessed it. Um, so, um, you know, you want to get yourself at least um, a good idea of what it is that they're thinking about because they won't always tell the TC everything. Another trick to maximize the authority concept from Chaldean I talked about earlier is when the doctor enters the room, make sure the TC um, introduces them. It's not because there's some ego trip for the doctor that they need to be important, but the doctor, we want to position the doctor in the, in, with an authority position. They're the expert. And having someone else introduce you builds that authority, that um, uh, sort of the, the feeling of that. So uh, all the award shows, you know, they have someone who introduces the people who are going to be the ones that tell you who wins the award. They don't just walk out on their own, right? And so that makes those people seem more important. Uh, having someone introduce you transfers that process to the authority. So Mr. and Mrs. Jones, this is Dr. Uh, Dr. Reynolds or Dr. Jamie is what I go by or whatever it is you want to use. Uh, just make sure that happens as you walk in. And again, a lot of these are not earth-shattering, seismic moving things, but each one has a, if you, if you follow this process, is one little more hole you're plugging in your bucket. And that's one or two patients here or there. And each one of these little things along the process are things that you can do predictably and over and over again to make sure that you're following the right process. Okay. Orthodontist, when you walk in there, you know, first thing is to go straight to teeth. You want to be a human being, you know, talk to them, be friendly. How, you know, look at that cheat sheet you have before. How's baseball? And my son plays baseball or whatever it is that you can do to start up a conversation with him. Um, and, and so whether you do a TC driven consult or a doctor driven consult, before we get to the point of sale, before we ask them for money, the key thing to not being pushy is identify and address any objections before the doctor leaves the room or the TC presents the money. Okay, so you can do it either way, but before that um, slider comes out or before you start talking dollars and cents, make sure all the objections are there. So ask open and, excuse me, open any questions. Many times the, t the, the patient or especially the parent will tell the doctor something they didn't tell the TC, even though they asked them three or four times and You'll say something like, hey, how you do, what can I do for you? And then they'll tell you something totally different than tell the, the TC. And the TC looks at you like, what the hell? I just asked them that three times, right? So whatever we can do to continue to ask them questions that we can get what brings them in uh, is the critical part. So there's a lot of things you can do in the exam. You know, uh, Chris Foss calls them calibration questions. So what can I do for you? And then you keep asking, you know, the why based questions say, well, I want Invisalign. Tell me what you know about Invisalign. Many times in my office, they'll, uh, they'll say, well, those clear braces over there, those Invisalign ones, right? So they're thinking clear braces are Invisalign or they're thinking Invisalign is clear braces, right? So if I spend a bunch of time talking about plastic aligners, I haven't answered what they really want, which is clear braces, even though they call it Invisalign. So you just keep following up to make sure you understand exactly what they want. You know, um, one of the principles of influence is, uh, if you remember, we talked about 
people who identified one thing about their insurance, uh, whether it was uh, why they said yes to buying insurance, whether it was they thought the person on the phone sounded nice or it was the right price or whatever it was, they just picked something were 15 percent more likely to buy that insurance. Um, you know, asking questions like, if I had a magic wand, you know, what would you have me wave it in your mouth that I could correct? And so they might say this or this or this, or they might start talking about their nose or whatever it is. You want them to make that commitment and that makes them more committed to the fact that they're going to do treatment and more likely um, to decide to become a patient. And remember, we're not recommending treatment to anybody who we don't think should get treatment. So then us being able to communicate to them the value of why they should get treatment, whether they see overbite as a value or crooked tooth as a value, having them start when we recommend is good for them. Okay, it's a win-win scenario. You want to stay away from options. So um, one of the surefire ways to not start a patient is to say, well, you could get extractions. You could do two upper teeth. You could do two upper teeth and two lower teeth. Or if you don't want to take teeth out, you could do these tads or a headgear or an expander. So just tell me which, uh, which one is interesting to you and then talk with dad and call us back, right? Um, a lot of times we're, we practice so afraid that if we don't tell them everything and let them pick that somehow we're going to have liability or sue them. And liability comes from having a poor relationship with the patient and most times from sending the patient to collections because they don't pay you and they're pissed and the only recourse they can do is to, is to sue you. And occasionally if they get cranky with you, um, you know, it's about money and you can refund their money and, and they'll sign an, uh, a waiver in exchange for getting the money back. And those are most of the reasons why people get sued. They don't, they don't get sued because you recommended teeth out or TADS or not take it out or expand it versus headgear. That's just not, not what happens. So what you want to do, if there's any confusion along the way, is say, um, you know, I, I've been studying this for a long time. Would you mind if I told you what I would do for my own daughter in this circumstance? And they're always going to say yes, because that's why they're there to see you. And then you tell them. Um, and then, you know, what do you think about that? Well, I really thought this extraction option was better or I actually was hoping we couldn't do extractions. Well, okay, well, let's talk about that. And so when you, when you get out of the room or when you get done or before you start to present the cost of treatment, you want to have picked something. Ultimately, you're going to have to treat them one way. You're going to have to start one way. Uh, teeth out, not teeth out, headgear, no headgear, whatever it is, you've got to start one way. There's only one way you're going to start. So you want to get to that, talk about it with them, agree that that's the way, whatever way it is, and then present the fees. Options are a surefire way to confuse them and they'll leave and probably never come back, okay? And many, many, many orthos present options. Don't do that. Get to the bottom of what you want. And then if you need to, you know, say something smart sounding like mesial buckle, go for it. Especially younger doctors, you can tell that more to the TC, giving them some fake findings. But um, if your process has done a good job along the way, the authority is, is secondary at that point. And this is attributed to, uh, to Dr. Phil, but, um, you know, it's really Will Rogers uh, never miss a good chance to shut up. So as you're asking these questions, many of us like to tell them everything we know about mesial buckle this or physiologic that. Ask them a question and shut the hell up, right? And, and most of the time they'll tell you exactly what they need to hear from you in order for them to start treatment. And regardless of what they say or what you want to tell them is so important, shut up and tell them, you know, talk about the things that they're telling you are important to them. It's the biggest mistake we all make in the consultation process. That's why we recommend doctors stay out of it for most of the time because they talk about what they think is important and they are very bad at talking about what the patient thinks is important. And again, remember, you're not going to do something different in the clinic just because you talked about a lower incisor, you're still going to correct their overbite. So you just don't have to Tell them as much about why overbite's important if they don't care. And you definitely don't want to confuse them. So talk about what they want, go do your thing, and give them a great result. And, and above all, be authentic, okay? So uh, don't be somebody that you're not. There's, uh, before, I think, especially when I started and, and maybe the generation in front of us, we we're all trying to be something maybe that we're not, which is this white coat, um, blah, 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 doctor who never has any fun and never has a glass of wine or never does this or never does that. And now, um, you know, with all the Instagram and this and that, like being unique, being your own self, um, you know, is really important. You know, uh, 
there's tons of examples out of that from the Glenn Krieger. The Chris Feldman is a great example. Um, and his guys' practices are killing it. Uh, Amanda Gallagher does some great stuff on And there's Kyle Fagel is Cole Johnson in his rap video. Like, <laughs> it's amazing, right? So, but it's authentic. Now, on the flip side, like, just because Cole Johnson can pull off his crazy crap that he does on his Facebook page doesn't mean that you can't, right? So it, it, don't go out there and try to be the next Karen you know, wig, dress up as a, a Karen, girl Karen um, on your TikTok account, right? Uh, if you try to do that, it's not you, you're not going to pull it off, right? Um, there's only so many of those in the world. So figure out what it is you and, and be authentic. Don't try to be somebody that you're not and, and be genuine with them and try to be consistent. So recommending some things one time, if people come back again, just for a double check and you set teeth out one time, but expand or the next time, they're going to be confused. So be authentic and be consistent. So along the way in the process, <clears throat> we hit it eight times um, with the same day start. Um, we're foaming the runway all the way along. And so you want to hit them all the way along the way with what we think is important, uh, with the ability for them to be able to same day start. So it's not surprising at the end. When we talk about financial strategy, I just want to uh, breeze through some principles we've talked about a lot before. Um, you know, a lot of people think cost is the most important. So the data that we have shows on your x-axis here is total treatment cost and your y-axis is conversion. And then when you put these bars on, you see that the lowest converting practices are the ones that charge the least. Um, so, uh, and once you get above 5,400 bucks, the conversion is a bit all over the map, which says to you that there's something more important than total price involved, uh, which we know. And there's many, many successful businesses out there that charge a lot for their services and do very well and do better than the cheap ones, right? Think of all the hotels and restaurants and food services and all this other stuff, car manufacturers where people will consistently pay more for it, but they just have to understand the value there. So it's not about price, it's about value and affordability. Can they afford it? And so what these bubbles are are credit scores. So this is credit scores and this axis is down payment. Okay, so as this goes up, we assume that people who have higher credit scores or probably have more money and will put more money down, which according to this trajectory here is true. Um, but if you look, almost all of them are below a thousand dollars down, right? And even the highest credit score, if you let them choose their own is, is averaging 1100. So if you're charging 1500, $2,000 for your down payment, you're charging double what even the best credit score would want to pay. And then the very interesting thing, and we've talked about this a lot before, you know, if you draw a vertical axis around the monthly payments between 185 and $210 is where all the credit scores fall except the lowest. So thinking that affordability is an important, you know, if you're not offering that like $200 a month plan for them um, or your down payments too high, then you're missing the boat for what your people want. Um, also people will pay interest. So anywhere between 10 and almost 20%, depending on your local demographics, pick interest. And so the average price for interest bearing accounts because they pay interest is about 400 bucks more than the average price for the rest of Orthofy. So they'll pay more, but in exchange for paying more, they want $500 down and $150 a month. So between 10 and 20% of your practice will willingly pay you more if they see the value for it in exchange for $500 down and 150 a month, they'll pay interest. So uh, for a while, interest would seem like, you know, the, the antichrist of ortho no one would ever do it but we've got tens of thousands of patients that happily pick interest bearing accounts and remember if you have if they if you take credit card in your office which almost all of you do your credit card is charging like 20 to 30 percent interest right and i think it's unreasonable to assume that every single one of your patients pays their credit card bills on time and if they if they pick a monthly payment that they can't afford just because they want to give their kids braces like a lot of parents will stretch for their kids for things they can't afford Maybe they pick a 300 payment when all they can really pay is 200, but they want to get it from your office anyway because they see the value. Every month they're going to be paying 20 to 30 percent interest to that credit card just to make that bill. And it's going to take them forever. Whereas if you charge them five or six percent interest because you're an orthodontist, you make your money on braces. You're not a bank that makes your money on interest. You'll give them a patient a payment that they can afford that will save them a ton of money on interest and will help their credit score. So you're really helping a lot of people by offering interest to them. Now you say, well, only people with bad credit um, 
uh, chooses interest, and this is the, the credit score on the bottom. And so over here on the left, yep, that's the lower credit scores, and there is a distribution there. But there's also quite a few people who have excellent credit, probably better than many of the doctors and team members in the office, <coughs> and they still choose interest-bearing accounts because the, the notion that only poor people um, have be or only the only people with good credit are rich people and the only people with bad credit are poor people is totally false and, you know, and pretty like, you know, uh, I think maybe you kind of be ashamed of yourself to think that way because there's tons of good people who will never miss a payment so long as you make it affordable for them and they just don't make a lot of money, right? And that's okay. So you want to um, you want to offer them things, you know, they'll pay and we'll get into some of the financing stuff in just a minute. So when you're thinking your financial strategy, you want to lead with affordability, um, but you want to be intelligent with how you do that. So you don't just want to say, hey, do you want zero dollars down and ninety nine dollars a month? You want to start um, when you're, you know, with, hey, our, our um, you know, our best deal, um, you know, we have a discount for paying in full. You can save three percent, which is one hundred and seventy five dollars if you pay in full, which brings your total to this. Would you like that? Right. You want to have a conversation with them when you start at the top and work your way down. And we get into that in more detail in the uh, in the other course I mentioned to you. If you're going to use a slider or not, um, there uh, you can make the negotiation either verbal or digital or whichever way you want to do it, but there are some things with OrthoFi slider in particular that are there for a reason. Uh, the first thing, uh, we say most popular on there because that's social proof, right? This is what other people are picking. So we've learned that wherever you put that most popular, you'll get the highest density of down payments picked because people like to do what other people have picked. So if you're having your most popular at 500, you'll get a lot more 500s. If you move it up to 750 or 850, you'll get more 850s. So one of the ways to get more down is to simply put some social proof on the slider. Okay, very simple. Second thing is you want to offer them a reason to put more down. Hey, look over here. If you put more money down, there's a discount. And so we offer pay in 50%, you get a discount. Pay in 75%, there's a discount there. Pay in full, there's another. In our office, it's 1, 2, and 3%. You can set them whatever you want. But you'll see on the dots, stratifications on each of these amounts is where people pick. So that's an option for them to put more money down to save you the collections trouble later and to help your cash flow and to allow you to also make lower down payments for other people who can't afford it, right? And then the third thing is interest. So if you offer zero interest for everybody, then people really don't have a disincentive to choose your longest terms and your lowest monthly which is then becomes a cash flow and a collections issue for you later. So you want to have some interest there. You don't want it to be 30%, you want it to be 5, 6%, right? And then you want that to show up when you start to get beyond your treatment time because now you're financing them after you have the braces off, okay? And so a lot of people will slide the bar to here and then stop, right? This is a disincentive, okay? And so they'll stop here. And so when you look at the way the slider looks, you know, you've got your higher same day cash you know, down payments and, and uh, pay in fulls combined uh, because you have those discounts there. You've got your interest, which is your guardrail. Uh, so you give flexible to those who need it. And you can see over here that you can go as low as $94 a month, right? So some people, they need that. Some people, they don't. But they're paying interest, which hedges your bet. We'll talk about that in a bit. And then that open choice, you know, letting them choose whatever, you get this distribution. These are monthly payments uh, and down payments on the x-axis. These are all the places that people pick. So you look, you know, they might pick $4,500 down and $50 a month, which is crazy. Why wouldn't they pay it in full? I don't know, but people pick that. Or they may pick um, $250 down and $700 a month. Like, why would they pick that? Why wouldn't they put $700 down? I don't know but they pick it and you get this big wide distribution of dots. Uh, most of the time the plans here that people offer are here, but these are all plans that are very favorable to the doctor and you can use those down payments and monthly payments to um, allow the people in here to pay for treatment. So again, these lower monthly and down payments, if you offer them, require more cash flow, which you get from these payments over here. You just don't take this guy who paid 4500 and go put it as a down payment for your jet ski if you want your business to grow. Uh, if you want your business to grow, then you take some of this money and you allow somebody to put $200 down who wants to buy aligners. Okay? So that's creating leverage in your business using some of the things from over here um, that we talked about last time to go in here, and that allows your business to grow. And still, given people who can pick whatever they want, 
still a nice distribution of pay in full, same day cash, down payments, and monthly payment plans. Now, <clears throat> you know, uh, you can, you know, control freak uh, is designed, uh, defined as a person whose behavior indicates a powerful need to control people or circumstances. And I know that there's no control freaks in orthodontics because a profession that where a millimeter is a long way um, certainly doesn't uh, attract people who like to micromanage every single little thing. Um, I, I've, I've met a doctor before that said he won't let anyone in the team change the toilet paper because they screw it up, right? Like, so people in our business, I think, like to manage things uh, to the nth degree. And our treatment coordinators, uh, they'll do that too. And so what we found over the years, like I mentioned before, uh, I had a treatment coordinator who hates interest. And so she steers people away intentionally or otherwise from paying interest on our plans, which is in many times not in the best interest of the patient because they get payment plans that they can't afford and then they pay the credit card company interest anyway, right? That's um, projection as we talked about before. And so there's an awful lot of projection that goes on in orthodontic offices. And then there's an awful lot of trying to outsmart the system. So what I'm gonna show you is a couple things here, okay? So this is practice A. We have this plot distribution like we just showed you, okay? And so what this is over here is down payment, and this is treatment length, okay? Now this office, OrthoFi Slider goes to 36 months, that's what we recommend. Um, we do have the ability to customize it, and we've run a bunch of data over, over time, uh, which we can talk about at another time, uh, that shows we have a recommendation called the Optimized Plan, which takes all this stuff into consideration and figures out the smartest angle for you to do, okay? And it's the reasons like this why I want you to choose this. So this office, and uh, if you look, they have a, you know, would be a middle class neighborhood uh, median household, 62K, right? And so they're thinking that we want to make as low as down uh, monthly payments and low down payments for people as we can so we can still charge our, heart, charge our high fee, right? So they, they blocked out the slider to 48 months. And so if you look here, this distribution is skewed to the left. Most of the down payments are very low, very few out this way. Okay, and so um, and so what it led to was you know conversion that's very mediocre, fifty percent, uh, same day cash again that's on the lower side and longer payment terms. Okay, and so the next slide here is a slide that the office you know was using letting the slider do the work more than trying to influence or outsmart the slider. And so if you look here, you have a much wider distribution of the dots. So the width of the dot um, distribution uh, is, is more important, you know, so you want wider rather than taller. And if you look, you have same household demographic, in fact, lower, 53K, right? But here you're at 77% conversion, 43% same day cash, and 19 payment months rather than 25. And so what you've done, open choice, allowing people to choose more of what they want whether than trying to outsmart the system, we've proven that it works, okay? So even more now so than ever, the customer wants what they want and they're less willing to take what you try to push on them. And so letting the, the smart things that are designed behind this slider or in your own negotiation, having more of your pencil and paper of an open conversation with them about what they're looking for rather than forcing options that you think you want on them for will give you a better distribution. So it's very powerful. Let the thing work. Talk to your patients. Make sure you're doing what they want and the financial stuff will follow. Okay? And you say, well, how do you know from these practices that the TC was doing everything you, th you say they are? And I think it's easy from the dots to sort of know the trend, but no, we don't know the conversation in these two practices and everything that the TC said. So one of the features that Orthofy also has is sign from home. So this is um, if the patient doesn't start, uh, the slider is sent home to them with an email that they can click on and they can um, pick the payment plan. You know, if they got to talk to dad, then, you know, dad can go and, and sit there and play around with the slider just like mom did at the exam or, or whatever. And so this is a circumstance where there's zero TC involvement. They're sitting on their couch looking at the slider. And if we look at that, um, you know, this is the blue is start from the office and the green is start from home. This is pay in full, right? So pay in full from the office, 24%, pay in full from home, 29%. 5% more people pay in full from home. 
If we look at average down payment, 730 versus 822 from home. Average same day cash, down payment plus painfuls, as you went, might uh, guess, $240 more from home. So what that tells you is that there's a generalized bias uh, and projectionism amongst our TCs and our doctors of what we think the patient wants versus what they actually want or are willing to do. And if we just focus on making the conversation about them and what they want, more about either A, what we want, or B, what we think that they want, the results, shockingly, are better. So we're down throttling the financial practice uh, performance of our office by projecting our thoughts uh, on our prospective customers. So if you're using a slider concept, let that do the work. Uh, make sure you include those interests and uh, discounts. One just note on interest, interest is very complicated um, and you need to have proper truth and lending disclosure if you're doing interest. So, um, and if you, if someone refinances their payment along the way, which happens frequently, they rework their terms because they miss a payment or whatever, they get behind. Changing that interest calculation is very difficult. It took us a while with a lot of people a lot smarter than me to figure it out. So if you're trying to do this in your office, I might avoid going straight to interest because if you charge someone the wrong interest and you charge the wrong someone the wrong interest, it could be very sticky for you with truth in lending, um, which you probably don't want to find yourself in. So if you are going to choose to do interest in your, pay, in your practice, make sure it's managed by a professional company that does that. Now, what happens when the patient doesn't say yes, they don't want to start? Well, you should be doing some sort of follow-up. So this is a screenshot of the penny management tool that works um, kind of like your email that you can snooze. So if mom says, hey, can you call me on Tuesday? Then this will pop up on Tuesday with something for you to do. And there's a name here that I blocked out. And so this slide is less about to show you the slickness of the tool, although it's very slick. Um, but a, a good portion of clients who, who, who have Orthofy don't actually use this. So you know, people might say, hey, Orthofy is expensive or whatever, and they complain about it, but uh, people aren't using actually the features of the software, so they're not doing the pending management follow-up. They're not using this tool. And so we can see when you're using it and when you're not, and the offices that actively use this versus the office that don't have an 18% higher conversion rate, 18% just by using the stupid tool. So you could pay for Orthofy in perpetuity um, just by using the tool with the amount of conversion and then some. You pay for 10 Orthofys um, just by using the tools that are there. So the process is so important, you know, and the technology piece, if that helps you do the process, you know, the technology is there to augment the process. So if you're not following the process, if you're not following up with your patients, um, A, if you're not good with filming the runway for the same day start ahead of time, and then B, if you're not good at following up with the patients who still may do business with you afterwards, you know, your, your bucket is very leaky. If you're using the software, make sure you're using the pending management. And, you know, doctors, if you don't know what your team is doing because you let them handle it, make sure you're talking with your um, ortho success manager and looking at the reporting so you know where your bucket's leaky because they can tell you and say, hey, you need to focus on this. Now, if you don't focus on it, that's on you, right? But the information and the metrics should be there to give you some objective success. So we talk about collections, maybe you remember the White Walkers from um, Game of Thrones. I read all the books, I'm a total nerd, and had fun with the, um, the series. And apparently there's a, another Game of Thrones prequel coming in 2022 that I'll be excitedly awaiting. Um, but many of us treat our patients with either low credit or people that we think are credit risks like the White Walker. And so we, we charge $2,000 or $2,500 down or $3,000 down for our C patients, right? If we grade them that way, A, B, and C. And what you've effectively done is built this insurmountable wall that they can't um, around your practice that says keep out, right? Because they'll never be able to afford to put that down. And so one of the things that we hypothesized at the beginning when we were doing OrthoFi is that, hey, you know, we looked around at other things like banks who are professional lenders and other things, people who give out credit for uh, a living. And we talked to a lot of them and they said, no, no. You know, there's ways you can do it. We, the reason why the OrthoFi slider goes up to 36 months is, is there's a lot of data that there becomes payment fatigue after 36 months. So they stop paying after 36 months. We want to do 36 months or sooner. We showed in that last slide that you can still have a great conversion percentage by uh, um, offering that long, and you can still get most of the people to pick higher down payments when you offer that long. So you don't want to build this humongous wall around your practice to keep those patients out. What you want to be smart 
about how you book your plans, how you pencil the deals, as banks would call it. You want to have a wide range of different deals. So some people pay in full, some people finance it, and everywhere in between. And then you want to be really smart with your collections. So whether it's somebody professional like Orthofy or Orthobank or someone else that's doing your collections for you, um, you want to have a process. Okay, this is a 22-step process that has emails, calls, retries, retry the credit cards, calls, 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 and whatever, all the way along the way so that um, you're following up with that patient. You're not just doing it once a month. So on the second Wednesday of every month is when your collections people makes all the past due calls, right? But then they're on vacation one time, so then it happens two months. And then people get too far behind and blah, 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 or the office is busy that day, so they didn't get to it. So you want to have a process in place that does a few things. One, it starts at day zero. So the first day they miss a payment, you're on it, right? You're sending them stuff. You don't want to wait. If they miss it on the 16th and your process starts on the 15th, then they've gone 30 days without you actually talking to them about it, which may be too late. You want to start on the day that they fail, right? It wants to be consistent. So it works the same on every patient every time. So you have this process that you walk them through that makes the sequence on every patient every time, starting at day zero. We want it to be repeatable. So, um, you know, if the person takes a day off, somebody else picks it up and you want it to be scalable. So as you grow, the process stays the same. So these are the things you can screenshot or do whatever, put it in, in place in your office or have a professional manage it. But this is what has the most to do with collections is your process and your protocol and not the fact that you have different credit tiers in your practice. The process is far more important. Credit tier is important but not nearly as important as the process. And so when you think about defaults, um, what this graph shows um, is the uh, amount of people in the dollar amount um, on the vertical axes. And then on the X axis, it shows the point in time when they, uh, point in their estimated treatment time when they default. So for example, if you told someone they were in treatment for 12 months, uh, is their estimated treatment time, this would be, they would be defaulting at 12 months, 100% of their treatment time. If it was 24 months, it would show up at the same thing. So whatever their estimated treatment time would be, this is, you know, 100%. So if it was 12 months, then 12 months, 24 months, 24 months. And what we found is that, which is pretty shocking to us, 95% of default happens before treatment length, right? So all this stuff over to the left is when people default, especially early. And so what do we do? If, if people aren't paying, we keep their braces on, we hold them hostage. And so really that's only... 5% of the people there. <clears throat> and, and many of the times uh, people get behind because we have crappy collection pro processes in place. So we put, we pencil deals for them that they can't afford uh, by projecting our bias onto them. We put bad collections processes in place because we don't know how to set up a good collections process and we don't have the, you know, the, the team resources to do that type of collections process. And at the end, when a handful of them haven't paid us all, then, then we keep their child in braces until grandma can come up with the money or whatever. And so, you know, we should, I think, collectively be ashamed on ourselves for not taking braces off for people or not allowing them to finance beyond treatment time. And only your business is hurting for it. Um, so it, the data certainly doesn't support that. And, you know, the average patient who defaults, you collect 2,500. So if you're charging, you know, five or 6,000 for braces and your overhead is 40 or 50%, you're making your money back on the average default. You're not losing. You just push. And so that's what's called the cost of doing business. So keep that in mind. Um, you know, so we took a slice a while back of 38,000 active plans and about 100 million in receivables. And so of those, about 9,200 of them um, were paid or should have been paid. They were at the term. So if it was a 30 month treat, uh, payment plan, it was at 30 months or longer. So that was about $38 million in production. Okay. And of that, the default rate was 0.7%. Very low. Okay. So letting them pick whatever they want across all those plans, 0.7% out of this random sample. You say, okay, well, what about, that was all plans. What about the extended plans? Those are worse, right? And the answer is yes. Of those, about 10,000, 11,000 were 25 month or longer plans, which amounted to about $61 million in production. And of those, yes, the default rate was 2.7%. That was higher. But remember, you charge interest on those, which is a hedge on, um, on, you know, against your risk for extending them. So it still puts your default risk at 1.3. 
Um, and for a long time, 1.5% was the gold standard for default. So even on your risky plans, you're below the gold standard for default risk. And so if you, ver if you bear with me for a little math here at the end, you know, Kyle's will talk about this in his, his talk too. You need to understand what's called fixed costs and marginal costs. So fixed costs are associated with running the business and they don't change when you start a new patient. So that's things like rent, salaries, cable bill, whatever. Those are there. I'm sitting in my office today. There's no patience. I still owe today's rent. I have this light that's shining on me. I still owe today's electricity bill. It's the heat's going. I still owe that. That's there no matter what. If I start a new patient, though, that's what's called a um, incremental cost, right? Those vary based on how many patients you start. And so you have to go a certain point into the year before you cover all your costs for your rent and what. You have to start X number of patients in order. You just pay your bills, right? And then the incremental costs are, you know, um, they're there if someone starts, they, they aren't if they aren't. So that's the cost of your expander, the cost of your braces, the cost of your aligners. Um, those aren't there if you don't start patients. And once you get to a certain volume, every next patient that you start doesn't cost you your fixed overhead. Your rent's already paid and only costs you cost your braces and lab bills, which is a much lower percent of overhead. So let's call it, you know, 15, 20, even the big ones would be 30 percent. Um, you know, it, it doesn't cost you your full 50 or 60 percent of your net overhead. So if you say that the, the $61 million in production that were from those extended risky plans are incremental, what that means is if you didn't offer those extended plans, they wouldn't do business with you because they couldn't afford it. So let's assume that $61 million comes in at that incremental cost. So you're only really paying braces and wires on that. And this is for a cross orthofy, right? Think about it as one big practice. That incremental revenue comes in at a different margin because you're only paying for braces, your rent's already paid. You've paid that with the patients who have the other payment plans. So 70 to 80% profit, right? Or, or more, depending on if you're not using an aligner case or whatever. So if we do the math, remember the default risk across all plans was 0.7. The extended plan risk after the interest is 1.3%. So by offering extended plans, you have a 0.6% a um, increased default. So if you take that 60, almost 61 million, you multiply it by this, you're gonna have this much more default on those patients than you would if the risk was for the same as it was for the lower. So you're taking on more default risk. But the extra production that you get when you multiply that times your margin is 42 million right on this of the 60 million so most of it comes in as profit right so basically you're saying hey if i went to vegas and i put down a three hundred and sixty thousand dollar chip and they paid me back 42 million how many times did you do that right you do that every single time and so if you if you shrink the numbers and make it a little bit more um, realistic for your own practice so you move the decimal point a little bit to the left and you said hey if if i were to give you $3,600 in risk and you'd get $425,000 back in profit. So if you, if you started to treat patients with extended plans in your office, and yes, they defaulted more, which you might want to focus on of look at my increased default, but you get all this extra production, how often would you do it? The answer is every single time. It's the, it's the most no brainer thing ever in your practice. These, the patients that you, the incremental patients that you get from being affordable, the profit on that is by far the most profitable thing that you can do in your practice. So you, of course you should. And plus, you know, those patients that, you know, can't afford things as much by, by being able to get your high end treatment, you're really helping those families. You know, they, they wouldn't be a, many times in their life, they can't afford something as high a quality as you'll be able to give from them by just understanding the math here. Uh, and it's a win for them. They get that quality and it's a win for you because you get all that incremental revenue. So it's a mic dropper, right? Like to not have this financial strategy makes no sense in your practice. And by not adopting it, you're just letting patient after patient after patient either not walk through to begin with or, um, or not start because you're not making it affordable. The opportunity for the growth far outweighs, far outweighs the risk. So this is the, um, uh, the link to the masterclass where Danielle and I um, 
get into the weeds about the exact scripting. It's another 90 minute, about 80% of the information in that is different than what we talked about today. Some of the same financial strategy stuff, which you can cruise through, but the rest of it is, is the objection management value creation and how you walk the exact scripting through, both for virtual and in-person consults. Um, and so I'd encourage you also, Brian writes on there and uh, our good uh, Doc Waldeman from uh, Beverly Hills talking about um, virtual consults. Really, really good stuff. Um, I'd be remiss uh, without thanking my boy Oliver Gillis, who um, is, is the man behind most of these graphs and a lot of the strategy thinking. And we spent many hours trying to solve the world problems. And Dave Turner, our CEO as well, and a lot of the team at, at Orthofy. Um, Oliver has been instrumental in helping me develop a lot of these presentations and the papers we've written in the, the book we're, we're working on. So stay tuned for that. So. Um, Back to the slide where Kaz is uh, shorter than me, which I will revel in for a minute. Uh, I look forward, I guess you should stick around because uh, his talk coming up next, I've heard it a bunch of times and um, each time it gets better. There's a ton of great information about working with your team and building an amazing practice. So um, thank you very much for your attention this, uh, both this evening and last evening um, in December. And uh, I'm on Facebook if you, um, if you need to reach out and get a hold of me and find me there. Um, now that the election is over, I actually might look at my Facebook again. I don't check it uh, very frequently, so if I don't get back to you for a little while, that's uh, no offense. But uh, if you want to reach out with me for some questions, feel free. And uh, otherwise, um, look forward to a great thing from Kaz and have a great rest of your evening. And uh, good luck to you in your practice and a, hopefully a much more exciting and less um, crazy 2021. So thank you all.